<laughs> right, and, um, I'm going to kick off the session. Um, Donna will be joining us. She's running a bit late. She's basically doing a, a podcast recording. So, so hello and welcome to this session um, hosted by the Microsoft Spotlight podcast. So that podcast is me and my co-host, John. Um, so we're going to be basically hosting uh, our panel in front of us. Um, first things first, um, you know, thank you to the sponsors, because without sponsors, these events will never happen. So it's great to actually finally get out of the house and start seeing people again. So um, quick round of introductions. So as I mentioned, my name's Andrew. Um, I basically work for Fujitsu as an Office 365 architect. Um, been doing that for 18 months there. And also on one half of the Microsoft Spotlight podcast. So I'm John Jarvis. I've aged incredibly since that photo. <laughs> That's about eight years ago now, seven years ago. You, 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 you fit off LinkedIn quite well. I'm really happy with that. <laughs> but I'm a principal consultant at CDW, uh, yeah, especially in, in Microsoft 365. So, uh, uh, hi everyone, I, I'm Zoe Wilson, I'm the Director of Innovation and Customer Success at a Microsoft partner called Agilisys. Uh, I'm also a Microsoft MVP for Office Apps and Services, uh, and I'm uh, one of the um, like organisers for the Women in Teams community as well. Hello. Uh, yeah. Um, hi everyone, so my name is Sophie DiMolo, I'm a Microsoft Cloud Consultant for the Pure Technology Group, as you can tell by my accent up north. Um, so we're a Microsoft house and we specialise in cloud adoption, productivity and security roadmaps. And I've just recently joined the Microsoft Women in Teams community and we're re re really enjoying it. Hello, um, my name's Sarah, Sarah Fenner. I'm a Microsoft certified trainer, specialise in Office 365 and Teams and have just recently become an MVP, so I'm still smiling about that. <laughs> Um, and uh, oh, women in teams, um, obviously teams is my life, not just my office, so um, that's why I'm here today. Thank you. And so obviously you know who Donna is, because obviously she's done the keynote this morning, so I don't have to really introduce her, um, but she will be joining us a bit later on. Um, so basically the whole like, layer of this, uh, this session is basically, I've got a bunch of questions that I'm going to basically post to the panel. Um, they're going to answer the questions and then we'll basically move forward from there. And I do have a few questions that were submitted by the community. One that really um, pissed me off. Um, <laughs> being open and honest about that. Um, and basically, I'll come to you guys and uh, get some questions from you as well for the guys in the panel. So, as I mentioned, first couple bunch of questions. So, what is the Women Teams community and why does it exist? So, do you want to answer that, Zoe? Yeah, thank you. So um, the Women in Teams community was set up a few months ago um, and essentially it's, um, it was set up by Laurie Potmeyer who works for Microsoft uh, with a view to bringing together all of the women that work, in, that work with Teams globally. So it's a really nice community that, um, that is made up of people all around the world who, um, you know, some of them are technical, some of them are coming at it from kind of a change adoption uh, perspective, um, you've got trainers in there, so it's a real, a real nice mix of people. And I think, um, you know, I think for some women, if they're the only person in, if they're the only woman who works in their IT department, for example, it just helps them feel a lot better to be able to connect with other, you know, to connect with other women that work with this technology and to be able to kind of share and learn from them. Um, and that's really why it exists as well. So um, it's you know it's super important that um, that we can bring uh, that we can bring women together and support them. Um, anything either of you two want to add? I guess just starting um, and coming in, what my, my experience from it is just having role models and having um, inspiring people around you that motivate mo motivates me more to do well. And and you can see the successes. And we all share our stories, no matter if you're at the beginning or, you know, sort of very experienced or leaders. Um, so that's what's, what's helped me. I don't know if you've got anything to add. Just that it's all about inclusion, so it's not just women. Yeah. Yeah. You're all welcome. <laughs> yeah, so I mean, the actual Microsoft Teams and community, I'm actually a part of that as well. Um, you basically fill out an online form and then basically it goes through a whole submission process and then basically get joined into that community. So then you basically start collaborating with obviously all the women that are basically already a part of that team and also see any events they're basically doing as well. Um, they run, uh, is, it, is it a monthly user group? Event uh, they run? Yeah, monthly call-ish. Yeah, yeah it, it's, been, it's been a bit quiet over the last, um, over summer, I think, 
I'm sure you can hear me anyway, but <laughs> it's, it's been a little bit quiet the last couple of months, but the, the next meeting um, is being scheduled for the start of November, I think. Um, and, you know, I would encourage you all to come and get involved. Uh, you can come and join the, the meeting. I think they have um, two different sessions to kind of cover the time zones. Um, but if anybody is interested, let me know and I can, uh, I can send you the form to uh, sign up. So uh, we've got a great panel today, um, all with different experiences within Microsoft Teams. Um, so do you have to be a technical person to be classed as a woman in tech? Actually, I was having this conversation with somebody in the room earlier today. No, if you work in technology, if you work in an IT business, you are a woman in tech. You wouldn't make that distinction if you weren't a woman. So why should women make that distinction? Um, for me, no, not at all. But when I first started being interested in women in tech, I thought it had to be just female leaders. And I used to do events. Uh, so prior to this, I was in IT recruitment for two years and I did a lot of um, boss events and it was more uh, targeted towards, towards female leaders. Whereas coming into it, you know, everyone's story is relatable, and um, we, we talk a lot about, I mean, in it, we talk a lot about the younger generation and how it can change perceptions, you know, e either now or in workplaces or in schools and universities and things like that. So everyone's got to start from somewhere. And so it's not just do you have to be technical, it's you could literally just be starting to get involved in, in tech or be interested in tech, and you're still, you're still welcome. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, um, you know, it's, it's pretty obvious that tech is just such a huge part of all of our lives. Um, you know, we've got um, our smartphones in our pockets. Um, so uh, you don't need to be technical, but I think, um, you know, we, we for, for me personally, um, I, so I, I come from a technical background. Um, and I, I absolutely kind of love to encourage uh, young women particularly to, to get stuck into the technical stuff because you, you don't have to be technical, but it's great if you want to be and you can be, and, and there's so much great stuff out there, out, out to learn. And I know we, we had this conversation with, uh, with Leslie and a few people yesterday. Uh, you know, I've, I've heard Leslie say a few times that she's not, she, she doesn't class herself as technical or as really like a woman in tech. And I, I just think, um, you know, you work with technology. So like Sarah said, you absolutely are a, a, a woman in tech. Sorry, it's some, it's something like we've done 18 podcasts now. And um, the last couple of podcasts we've said, like the IT industry itself is so varied now. What is a, what is a, what is a job in IT now? It's not turning off the computer and turning it back on again no more. It's not you know, data collection or anything like that. It, it could be a salesperson, it could be someone in project management, it can be IT recruitment, it could be so much, so it's, it's so varied now. Yeah, ab absolutely, and I think um, if you look at uh, if you look at what the future of work is going to look like over um, you know over the coming years, the the I if you think about it from like a support perspective, you know the amount of people who are providing IT support uh, in the traditional sense is going to reduce, and there'll be much more focus on business enablement. So what you know what is the business trying to do? How can tech enable that? And actually, I think that um, you know, there's kind of, because of the level of kind of empathy and connection that you need. I think there's a, there's a really great space that uh, that women can play in because they do tend to more towards some of those skills. So I think it'll be um, really interesting. I think it's um, the ed education aspect around it as well. I, you know, I used to think I weren't technical, but exactly what you said, anyone in the tech industry is. So it's it's educating people who are in the tech industry or want to be in it that, you know, you are, you are involved in this community, I think. I'm just going to finish by that question by saying, as, as a mother of a teenage boy who doesn't think it's impressive that his mum is in technology, he thinks it's impressive he's got a parent in technology, and I think that's fantastic. So it is changing. And I say, like, um, on a podcast, me and John recently recorded um, the guest for that one, Helena. Um, she basically come from a completely non-technical background. She's travelled all around the country. Um, I can't remember the country she originally started right. from. Is it, I'm not going to try and attempt it. Cause I, I screwed up on the podcast saying it, but literally, she come from a, a non-technical background, and basically, her daughter got told that she couldn't do t I I IT at school, which then basically set Elena on a whole entire career span where she's basically gone out, 
set up a whole entire new business which focus, focuses on women in tech and um, basically creating boot camps all around the world to enable teens to use AI. So you don't, you don't have to come from any kind of technical background, you don't have to be even interested originally in tech, but naturally people that we've spoke to on our podcast, at least 15 of them, have accidentally fell into IT. And basically from that, they've gone and gone, do, they've gone on to you know, strength to strength. As I say, like all the four panellists, when obviously Donna arrived as well, have all featured on our podcast, and every single one of them has shared their story with us and basically told us where they've come from going forward. So next up. So for me, um, this, this question is quite important. Is it important to have women visible at events like at night? I believe the answer to that is yes, because you, you need someone to basically look at and go, you know, I can be that person as well. Um, I had this conversation with Anne Michaels, um, who was the product marketing manager for Microsoft Teams um, out in Seattle. She's recently moved back to her native country in Germany. She's now become the COO of Microsoft Austria. And she's not a non-technical person whatsoever. Um, and basically, what she was basically telling me and John is that if she had to do anything technical, she'd basically go out, learn a little bit about that technical role, and then basically then go to things like Ignite and actually deliver that session confidently. So it's just having that confidence in yourself. And, and I think having more women um, present at Ignite, so uh, Karuna Gatamu, who did uh, like last year, just having people like that, even from a diverse background as well, is massively important. So to the panel. <laughs> so to the panel. That, that's, that's more a little bit. So. Well, how so, could we possibly disagree? <laughs> um, <laughs> when it's put so so eloquently. Now, um, for oh, me personally, it, it it's been great as I've been coming to these events to see more and more women at these events. It, it really does help you feel part of the community. There's just one downside for me. The queues for the ladies are starting to get longer. <laughs> but I'll put up with that for having more people here. Um, so last night at the speaker's dinner, we actually counted, well, we tried to count, me and Irfan, tried to count how many women uh, in comparison to men. And it was still something like, it was, it was below 10%. We counted about 30 women out of, what, 250 people or something like that. So we, we do need more. Um, you know, hence why I've come today and uh, I really appreciate the opportunity, so thank you. But yeah, definitely, I think, um, yeah, is the answer. We definitely need more people and I think it's important, even just me watching and me listening to people like yourselves, it's, it's what I need to see and um, it makes a massive impact on, my, on me and my future, I think. Yeah, absolutely. I, I still remember going to, I think it was the first SharePoint Saturday in London, um, and I just had such a great day, and everybody was so friendly, and um, I think it was probably within a year or two of that that I'd started kind of putting myself forward to, to speak at things, and it's just, you know, it, it's, it is incredibly rewarding, and, and the community are great, but like you say, we absolutely do need to get, um, get more female uh, speakers because it inspires other people to do it as well. Um, and, and Sophie, you mentioned that this is your kind of first one of yeah. these. Um, would you actually consider speaking at future ones now? You've kind of been here and you've seen what it's all about. Yeah, 100%. Uh, and it's such a nice community. Like, I, I came in the last day and I said, everyone's so nice and everyone's so friendly. And when I was walking here, um, a man literally stopped me and he said, oh, you're speaking? And I said, yeah, I even hear this. I'm like, yeah, yeah, I said my first one. And he said, no one wants you to fail and everyone wants you to do well. So, he, well, he actually said, your first couple of lines, I hope it was all right, um, <laughs> that will determine, you know, the sort of um, impact of the room and, and what they think. So, um, that's it. Everyone wants you to do well. And that's what I felt coming today and speaking. So, um, walking into the room just now, um, Donna Sakar, so... Hello, uh, but I think it's a it's a good it's a it's a it's a good question to ask ask you, Donna, actually, because obviously you, you spoke at today's keynote, you spoke at events like Ignite and 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 many around the world. How Im how important is it to have um, the women visible at events such as this and Ignite and others? Oh, that's that's a great question. Okay, so first I was late because I'm doing a podcast that thing. Then running around outside, <laughs> lost. So that was good um, until a guy in this other hotel parking lot's like, "Ma'am, you're trying to go that way." I'm like, hmm. "The nerdy badge." Okay. So first, it's important to have diverse speakers in general, right? Women are one kind of diverse speaker, but it's because representation really matters. Um, when you see a woman like Helen speaking, and you realize like, "Oh, 
Helen is not only a great speaker, but she also leads like a giant team of people doing really important things. And she's setting the standard for what hybrid works looks like here in the UK. And she told us, right, 6,500 employees, something. Very large number of people are being impacted by the work she's doing. So for the next generation of women who this might be their first conference, they're seeing that and realizing like, oh, I too can have a role like this. Not because of my own capabilities, but because this society is set up that this is possible. Often it's not women doubting their own abilities, it's that they look around and think, is the society set up to accept me as I am today, right now? So I think that's why it's important to have women speak at conferences. It's not to boost your own confidence. You speak at conferences because you know something. Uh, it's not like you don't know that thing. Um, but is the room set up to accept a woman conveying that message? It's often easier to do DNI panels, honestly, than it is to give a technical talk, just real talk. Uh, when I do a DNI panel, everyone's like, oh, of course Donna's doing a DNI panel. She's an expert at DNI. I'm not an expert at DNI. Um, and no one will come here and ask us terrible questions. It's not going to happen. He is. He's ready. He's like, I got lots of terrible questions. <laughs> but if, if I was going to go give a talk on Dataverse, I not, probably not at this conference, a very good conference, at Big Ignite, I was giving a talk on Dataverse, like introduction Dataverse. And the guy's like, well, have you ever implemented it? I'm like... Well, I built Dataverse, so let's say yes. <laughs> and he's like, well, how does this work? I'm like, okay, here's how this works, and that works, here's an entity, blah, blah. He's like, oh, you know your stuff. I'm like, are you quizzing me in front of 750 people? <laughs> and he said, no, I was just seeing. I'm like, would you see if I was my boss, who's a guy? No, right? So that is what women fear, that moment right there. When a guy, usually a guy, but uh, sometimes a woman will ask them a question to see if they really belong. That is the fear. The fear is not this. This is easy. This is fun. The fear is that moment because it happens to us often. I wish it didn't. It even happens to me now. I've been in industry for 20 years. I'm like really freaking old. I'm like, really? We're still on this? And I, the number of people who ask me this question, they're like, how do you deal with it? I'm like, because for every one person who's kind of a tool, there's zillions who are not. And the thing we all have to get rid of is this filter that filters us out the good messages and really just leaves the bad. So I spend more time fixating on the good than I do fixating on the bad. That's a long answer. That's a great, so, that's a great answer, Connor. I just, I just wanted to put... <laughs> I just wanted to put my perspective as a, as a white guy, as you, you'll see later. <laughs> like that, um, there's, there's context to that, you'll see that in a minute. Um, but seeing people like Donna, people like Karuna, and, and, and a lot of other people that speak at Ignite, it inspires us as well. Like, the, the, being, ins being an inspirational figure just doesn't stop because of your gender, your race, and, and stuff like that. You can, you can inspire a lot of other people because I, I see these people going in and, and talking in front of thousands of people, and I think, why can't I do that if they can? And yeah, um, all these people here, obviously, uh, in their respective jobs, are doing amazing, and, and in the community, amazing as well. We've got two MVPs, hopefully one aspiring one in the future, <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and 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 Donna, who, who need, needs no late, no other um, introduction. Um, so yeah, next question for yourself, isn't it? Oh, so one thing I want to touch on is obviously, you know, Donna is obviously is a seasoned pro, um, obviously coming to this conference and doing the actual, actual keynote. So for the likes of uh, Zoe, I mean, what was your first event and do you think things have got easier because of COVID? Um, so the first event that I spoke at was, um, it was SharePoint Saturday again, so I think two years, um, two years after, I, after I went and kind of saw it for the first time. Um, and I think, so I, I love speaking anyway. Um, you know, I, 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 I kind of, I do it a lot for my job. I get a lot of enjoyment out of it. Um, I think the thing that got, that got easier as a result of COVID was the ability to get involved in events that are maybe out of, um, out of reach geographically, that are in different parts of the world. Um, you know, so I've done things that kind of American ones and global events and all that kind of thing. Um, and I think that's really opened up a lot of access for people. Um, and, and, and you know, if you think about this from a, a, a woman's perspective, um, if they struggle with childcare and things like that, it makes it easier for them to, to be able to get involved without having to commit to traveling 
But I do think the flip side of this is um, just the, the huge volume that we've seen. You know, there are so, so many online events um, and it, it can be really challenge, challenging to kind of keep up and consume all of the content. And that community bit is a bit that was, you know, it's just been missing for me. I think it's been great to be able to kind of share, but it's just not the same, is it, as kind of seeing everybody um, in, in person at events like this. So, uh, you know, we, we had Comsverse that we were at uh, last month and then this, and it's just brilliant to, um, brilliant to be back in person again. Awesome. So um, I'm going to basically flip it now to some questions that I basically pushed out. Oh, I put a, a post out to basically get some questions from the community. And uh, some of the questions quite, uh, well, one of, the, one of the one questions kind of angered me quite a, lot, quite a bit. Um, do you want to bring up on the screen, John? So when I put this post out to so basically ask for questions, one of the first questions I got was, why is a woman in tech podcast hosted by two white dudes? <laughs> <laughs> so the first thing for me was, obviously I'm from a, a diverse background, is why is, why is colour, uh, you know, aspect of that to start off with? Why does it, I mean, do it make a difference if I was two black dudes, two Asian dudes? Don't make a difference whatsoever to me. So for, the, for me, that was the first thing that angered me. And I say, the whole Women in Tech podcast that me and John run. Um, actually, quick question. How many people listen to the podcast in the room? Any Not many. Got, got a couple. Wicked. All the rest. Microsoft Spotlight podcast. <laughs> Spotify. <laughs> YouTube. <laughs> like and subscribe. <laughs> <laughs> but um, basically, when I started um, setting up this podcast, um, my whole goal was basically focused on diversity, equality, inclusion. Um, John for a whole year basically pestered me to get his podcast off, off, off the ground. So uh, in the end, I was like, fine, we'll, we'll just do it. And then when we started basically looking at it and looking at the demographic of people we wanted on, I was like, you know, we'll start doing a, you know, a whole season about women in tech. And I think basically what's going to happen, what's kind of happened from that is the more we've done it, the more we've just kind of continued focused on women in tech because every conversation that me and John have had um, with obviously our panel in front of us, they all have different stories. They've all come from different backgrounds and, you know, I mean, obviously Donna runs her own clothing uh, design. So we have some from SharePoint. Um, Sophie's from recruitment and Sarah's a teacher originally. So everyone has a, a different story. Go on. Can you have a third question? Um, why is a woman in tech podcast hosted by two white guys? Are you genuinely surprised by that question? Because it sounds like a little bit you are. Not no, no, no. So I'm not surprised by the question. It's, it's, it's a valid question. So. The, the thing is, the, the reason why I was, I was so interested in starting the podcast, obviously, I like podcasts where people tell stories, stories about themselves. And every story is different, obviously. As you said, as Andrew just said, rightly, all four pe people in this panel here have a different story. Why don't we have stories that are engaging? The, spot, the spotlight of, this po of the podcast, the Michael Spotlight podcast, isn't about me and Andrew. We're, we're, we're irrelevant, really. We may be the characters that are, are asking the questions, but the spotlight is on the guest. We, we're, we're, just, we're just a mechanism to kind of help, to kind of help and, 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 and give the spotlight out. If, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not kind of saying it won't happen, but if me, and, me, if me and Andrew wasn't doing this, then would we have had 18 episodes on 18 fantastic guests? Oh, no. Because it's a valid question. Why are two white guys on? The, I think the conversation around that has to become advocacy, because you guys are great advocates and inspire someone like me. I, th I think, so so, for me, yeah. it's kind of un an uneducated question. It's a person that basically hasn't listened to the podcast, I because... I think uh, there's a bit of context missing as well here, that the person who posed the question was a white male. And they <laughs> for me the answer is it's about inclusion does it matter but i think the one of the reasons it was annoying is the context of who is asking the question and I, and I say it's uneducated from the fact that i don't think this person's ever listened to any of our episodes because i've basically spoke about my diversity you know quite a bit when yeah, andrew's not white <laughs> <laughs> no, i've got jamaican heritage so i know full well that i'm white but you know, I've spoken about my heritage on that podcast many times over because it's important to basically talk about not just obviously how where people come from. You know, it's all their different backgrounds. It's just, you know, everyone's equal. It, it doesn't make a difference. You know, what colour people are. From from my perspective, everyone is equal. Everyone has the equal opportunities to do the things they want to do. 
I mean, I, I come from a very much a working class background. My, my, my mother works in Asda, my, my father basically is a lorry driver. So me doing IT has been completely, completely different. So question at the back. I'm really disappointed with today, I'm going to be completely honest with you, because 10% of people in the room yesterday were women, and now 50% of the room are women. That means the people that should be here, the advocates, the activists, the passive actors, the people that should be supporting women aren't here. If we haven't got men in this room, we haven't had civil suffrage, right? Great. Because, and why aren't there men? Every man in this room should have brought another man, every woman in this room should have brought another man. Because without you, it ain't gonna happen, and you guys are inspiring, standing there, trying to make this happen, and that's the answer to the question if you ask me. Why are two white dudes or one mixed race? Because if you don't do it, and you're sitting in front of the table, it ain't gonna happen. Yeah, who's gonna do it? Right? So you have to be there is the answer for me, because we need advocates, we need activists. Yeah. And for me, you guys are, that's what I'll definitely do. Thank you. Go on, John, you can ask the So, yeah, the next one. <laughs> Go on. So it won't be two white dudes, it'll be me as well. One ginger girl from Yorkshire. And, yeah. <laughs> I'll try not to sh uh, take the spotlight away from John too much whilst you're away. Yeah, I'm on, ho I'm on holiday, Disneyland Paris, and Sophie's um, is, yeah. Is, yeah, doing a, hopefully, we'll do a great job. I will. <laughs> I know, yeah. I said, I said, well, I'll stop myself. <laughs> so there's a really interesting conversation happening here about allyship, right? And I, over the course of the last, I would say, year and a half, all of us have had to become allies to some group or another. I personally uh, believe that you don't get to call yourself an ally. The marginalized group has to decide you're an ally or not. So I, Donna, do not get to decide that I am an ally to, say, black people in the U.S. As you know, there's a lot of stuff going on. I was born in Detroit, Michigan. I've only had black colleagues until I was 21 years old. So my background is that. But I still, to this day, do not get to say, I, Donna, am an ally to black people. I can only be a hardcore advocate and a super fan until people who are black decide I am an ally. So allyship is not, you don't raise your hand for that. You do it until it is your identity, right? So I think that is the key with anything like this where you two raised your hands and said, we're just gonna do this, and everyone's gonna give us shit for it, and y'all are gonna wonder why are these guys calling us and asking to be on their podcast? But I actually quite like the questions you asked because they're about our work, um, and that's something I wanted to tell you, I guess in front of a room. Um, one of the things women get asked a lot, and I would say marginalized people in general, is about our identity more than our work. Like, what's it like being a woman? I don't know, I just wake up and kind of rock that. Like, <laughs> It's not that hard. Um, what's it like being, you know, a director of tech? Yeah, that's hard. Let me explain to you what that looks like. So I like when podcasts and interviews ask about our work because then it's like, yeah, how do you do your work? Is it different? Is your point of view different? Do you reach different people? And that is where the representation actually comes in, right? When you see the next generation of people saying like, yeah, I want a job like hers, right? Yeah, I already look like her, that's fine. I don't need to learn how to look like her more. It's how do I get a job like hers? How do I work like her? How do I study like her? How do I pursue passions like her? So I think we just have to focus on how can we ally better actively, ally as a verb more, until we become ally the noun. So that is what I've been working toward. How do I just ally better? And one thing I have learned is it works better with single people. You say, I am going to ally for this person here and hand over the mic every chance I get. So then they have a voice and they're able to go ally for someone else and they go ally for someone else. Um, and there's a lot of marginalized groups in the world. I think you know women in tech is an interesting problem, but black people in tech, black women in tech, Latinos in tech, Latin women in tech, these are all US focused because that's where I live. But also people with disabilities in tech, that's a real thing. 
and the more people we have with disabilities, visible or invisible, the better products we're gonna have. So it's just something for us all to keep in mind. Every single person here in this room has a chance to be an ally with the verb. And we should go out and, exactly what you said, go out there and convince the people in our lives to ally with us. And the best way to do that is to showcase good role model behavior. So thank you all for being here, first of all. I like seeing so many dudes here. Y'all getting homework already. Like, yeah. So, so, giving you jobs to do. Yeah. So um, the next question from the community was, has teams helped with your confidence when presenting? And if yes, which features have helped you? <laughs> well, without teams, I wouldn't have a job, so yes. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I don't think it helps with confidence. I think being remote has helped some people, but it's also a challenge for others. I think it's very individual. I don't think the features of the technology necessarily uh, you know, would help improve confidence. I think you gain confidence by doing something and getting away with it. Yeah, the first time I presented, I, I walked out there alive. People, people applauded. You know, you, you, you get confidence by doing things and then by doing them well um, and, and by moving on. So, yes, Teams does help, but not, I wouldn't pick a particular feature. Um, I, yeah, I mean, similar to yourself, it's, it obviously made it easier throughout COVID and everything else to, you know, do, do talks and to communicate with other people. But yeah, I wouldn't say it helped with my confidence necessarily. No, I'd, I'd absolutely agree with that. And I think I think one of the things um, for a lot of people is um, they don't know how to use the tech properly. So they might be able to talk, they might be able to deliver a presentation, but actually they don't know how to use Teams effectively. Um, and that can actually hinder their confidence because um, you know they're normally able to do something really well and they're struggling a little bit to make it look good. Um, I think for me, I, I love, 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 love the presenting capabilities. That whole, the whole feature set that you get in, in teams for presenting, I think is just phenomenal. And um, I actually trained my senior leadership team on the how to present with PowerPoint Live because that phrase, next slide please, needs to be eliminated from the collective vocabulary. <laughs> So I, I have made it my personal mission to, um, you know, to, to get everybody in the organisation kind of sharing and presenting properly. We're a tech company, you know, it's just basic stuff really. Um, and then I think once you've kind of got the basics, um, the confidence and, and things like that um, w will help. Um, it's not a Teams thing, but one thing that um, is helpful is PowerPoint Coach as well. Um, I think that's really great for people who want to get more confident with, um, with speaking. Yeah. Yeah, I'd, I'd, hap I'd be happy to happy to sit down with you. Um, you know, I'd, I'd, there's th there's just so much stuff. I mean, you pardon. Uh, I still have a lot of pain. I mean, I, sh I show I show our senior leaders how to do like you know how to present with PowerPoint Live, for example. And then uh, the next time we have a, an org wide town hall or something, you know, they've got a PA running the slide deck in the background, and they're saying next slide, please. It's like, it's like what what did I spend an hour showing you how to use this for? Um, but it's small steps, you know, it's baby steps. And I think um, the thing that drove me actually to do that session with our SLT was um, we, were, we were presenting, um, it was for a, a big bid we were working on. We, we had a full day workshop for the client and we'd done a couple of them where we presented with PowerPoint Live. We passed control around. So instead of next slide, please, each person took the control of the deck. They could move it at their own pace. Worked brilliantly, worked like a charm, seamless experience for the audience. Um, and then I went on holiday and came back and this bloke had just kind of taken over um, leading on the bid and he set it up. And after that, every workshop, he refused to do it the way that we'd done it previously because he said it was too high risk. And I was like, it's not high risk, it works. It works really effective, it looks good. Um, you know, it makes your meeting look effective, you know, it makes like the presentation in the meeting look effective. The reason it's high risk is because you don't know how to use it. <laughs> so, you know, it's not, it's not, a, high, it's not a high risk tech, it's, it's a, a high risk move for you because you've not actually spent five minutes playing with it.
So um, yeah, that, that, that just I think those those features are brilliant. Yeah. So I've, I have a question that's for Donna. That's my question, and you've hit the nail on the head because I was referring to PowerPoint Live, and it's given me a lot more confidence from mm. presenting and managing my Zoom. So yeah, that was that was actually my question. So you 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 got there. So yeah, yeah. And, and PowerPoint Live. I think if anyone if anyone hasn't used it, you know, I love the fact that um, you can see all of the the, the slide notes and all of that right yeah. within the the Teams meeting yeah. scaffold so you can see the chat. Because that's another one that really annoyed me. When you get people who say, I can't see your hand if you I can't see if you raise your hand because um, I'm sharing I'm sharing my screen um, you know, so they have obviously only got yeah. one screen. That and was don't need two screens either because it's no, yeah. amazing how it's all been compacted. Yeah, that's having that second screen. I've got you know, I've got two screens at home but I'm barely using it anymore because of PowerPoint Live. <coughs> it's brilliant, absolutely brilliant. Yeah. So um, Donna, how's, obviously, you being from the mothership over in the States. Oh gosh, yeah. <laughs> Our, Okay, so Teams and I have a very complicated relationship, right? Because <laughs> um, I'm like, yeah, Teams. Um, so I hate Teams presentations, just, just saying, because I am used to this. This is my entire life presenting with you beautiful people, right? I get to be obnoxious with all of you. I get to talk to you after. This is the best part of my job, is engaging with humans. Suddenly, you know, March last year, it's like, cancel all your conferences. They're all virtual. I'm like, what is that word? Um, you're going to be speaking to the screen. I'm like, is anyone even listening? Yeah, yeah, it streams to two billion people. I'm like, yeah, I hate that, right? Because you don't know if anything resonates. That's my big issue. Is any of this resonating? Does this make any sense? Here, you know, I'm getting your head nods. People are confused. I can, you know, make at atrocious jokes. These all land. They don't land on Teams at all. So I had to redo all of my presentation style and just be at like factual. And I hated it. Like honestly, I hated it so much. I, you just don't get my energy at all. So people who have heard me present online and meet me in person, they're like, you are two very different people. I'm like, yeah. The good thing, the one good thing, is you get to reach people who you may not get to see. So I was doing talks for like Zimbabwe and Uruguay and a talk for the um, penguin people in Antarctica, really. Like nine people in the penguin sanctuary. They got a Windows 11 talk. <laughs> um, just like places I've never heard of. Uh, what is it called? The island off of the coast of, you know, the South Pacific somewhere. These pla Tonga. These places that I haven't been to and I don't really get a chance to go to, I got to reach these folks. So that was the good part. But I am of the category that hybrid for me means me live with you, and it's streaming to people who ever want to tune in. That is my hybrid. Other people's hybrid will be very different. Other people's hybrid will be, I want to record from my home studio and have it stream here on a TV. And that is absolutely fine. But it really comes down to personal choice and energy levels. So that is my two cents. Thank you very much. Um, we are running close to time. So is there any questions from the audience at all? So I think it's, there's so many things, right? But some basic, basic things, and please all of you chime in as well. Um, the reason I'm in tech after all these years uh, is because I had, I have a very uh, enthusiastic father. He's fan number one. He is like super feminist, okay? He's, he's like militant feminist. Uh, he's like, okay? Satya's the CEO, I don't like that. You should be the CEO. I'm like, Dad! <laughs> and he's like, I'm gonna email him. I'm like, don't do, he's that guy. He's super feminist. He's like, Microsoft would be a better company if there were more women there. I'm gonna email Satya. I'm like, stop email Satya random things. Never mind. he's 70 years old, right? And I'm like, dude, you never worked in tech. You only worked at Ford Motor Company. He's like, and they have a female CEO. It's a much better company. I'm like, thank you, Dad. So that's one thing, right? Hardcore super fandom from home really does matter. On the other, in the workplace, what matters is doing exactly what you said, which is, hey, there's a women in tech conf, I wanna go. 
Will you go with me? One of my first managers, who I respect to this day, we haven't worked together in 12 years, but I always tell the story. We had the Grace Hopper Conference, which was a woman in tech conference that happens in the US, and I think it happens here too. And it's like 12,000 women in tech gather in like Dallas, Texas in a conference um, center to talk about tech stuff. It's a deep technical, but also a bunch of DNI stuff. And he comes over to my office one day and says, hi, I see Grace Hopper, things are open. And I assume he's gonna say, do you wanna go? We can fund this. He said, I wanna go. And I was wondering if you wanted to go too, because then you, know, you can tell me which sessions are the most important. And I thought that was one of the most interesting and eye-opening things that have ever happened. I'm like, Dave, you know Grace Hopper's not a tech conference, it's a women in tech conference. He's like, right. And I need to understand what the point of view is of women. Because why are women going to tech conference, women in tech conference? Guys should be at the women in tech conference. I'm like, yes. So he actually had his entire, all of the dudes who worked for him, who are all managers, attend this conference. And here they are, you know, 10 lonely, nerdy dudes wandering around by themselves. They're like, I know what it's like to be you now. I'm like, what? <laughs> They're like, it's really weird. I'm like, yeah. But it was a very eye-opening thing, that. And I would say the third one is really kind of straightforward, but it's hard to remember, which is pass the mic, right? Just pass the microphone over. You get a chance to speak, or you get a chance to have an answer. Be like, hey, actually, you know, I think Zoe should take this one. Actually, Zoe's the expert. Just pass the mic over. Sure. There's one thing as well I think which helps. I don't know if you've been in a um, in a meeting um, I have with um, other females that are technical, and they say something, and the whole room then looks at the male counterpart who is also in tech. Instead of just re saying the question, just say she was right. Like every, I don't need to I don't need to re answer this question. She was right. And, um, and and leave it at that. <laughs> I, I do think as well it's important to um, to sort of step in if you see that happening, um, but but also um, you know step in if um, uh, if uh, a, a woman um, if a woman's ignored in a meeting. Um, you know w women are often interrupted. Uh, not me because I'm quite loud and gobby, but <laughs> a, a lot of a lot of women you know will be interrupted. Um, and then just go go back to them. You know. Be, stop the person who's trying to talk and just say actually uh sarah was going to come in or sophie or you know whoever i think i think that's really important and it, it kind of needs to be called out um and there's i mean it, it running inclusive meetings is particularly with teams it's it's super important anyway and it's not fr from this perspective it's not so much about the tech it's about the the process you know so making sure everyone has a voice everyone has the ability to contribute and is heard um and um, I think it's important that people take steps to make that happen because it just it won't happen. It won't happen by itself. What if every dude did it? Hmm. If every dude in the meeting committed, nobody would step out of line because they were like, I'm gonna look like a fool in front of all my dudes. <laughs> dudes listen to dudes. That's just true. Women listen to women. We have an amazing back channel, by the way. <laughs> women <laughs> have an underground network like you have no idea. <laughs> If you wrong someone, everybody <laughs> they've known. They've <laughs> ever known. Am I wrong? They've <laughs> ever known in their life since childhood. No. And they, that dude is on the list. Yeah. Oh, yeah. This is why certain managers are like, women never want to work for me now. <laughs> 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 And it, it, go, it does go the other way as well because um, you know uh, we we, lot, we also share who great managers are, great sponsors. Mm -hmm. Before I came to this conference, uh, they asked, hey, do you need to speak at the conference? And I asked her out, and then day one time, a week before the trip, so she did it with a couple of years on this. Because I'm like, I don't want to be this whole thing, you know, woman speaker. And they're like, no, no, they're not like that. I'm like, oh, okay, cool. But I checked. Mm -hmm. Check. I think, hopefully, like, from what we can do is just basically start making that conversation, and hopefully everyone from this will basically take away, and go, you know, I'm going to start, you know, help promote diversity, equality, inclusion in my company as well and start, you know, progressing that conversation. I think, I think every business struggles with, you know, getting more women into tech or basically getting more women basically in technical roles or, or non-technical roles who are then basically doing presenting. Um, so for like me and John, um, I, I know from John's I've basically interviewed loads of people for roles in his business and not a single applicant was a female. And I know for I mean, in my team as well at Fujitsu, not, there's not a single female within my team. And it's something that, you know, 
both of us in our companies are trying to you know challenge and basically change yeah I'd, uh, sorry just quickly I'd, I'd, I'd completely echo that as well I think in five or six years of um, of hiring technical people uh, into roles I could probably count on both hands the number of uh, number of women that I've interviewed um, yeah I can count, count them on both hands I which is terrible I think also one of the big things we can do is just offer each other respect and support you know if, if your colleagues are good they're good whatever gender, whatever race, whatever issue they face. And the biggest support I've had in my career has been people who offered me that respect and taken time to let me go. And that's what I want from the people I work with. And that's what I want to give to people I work with as well. Okay, can I tell everyone my hack for hiring women that works? Go for it. It's volunteering. So here's what you do. All right, this is literally it, and I do it all the time. So I do this maybe th several times a week. You first follow women on, you know, you two obviously do. Follow women on Twitter, Instagram. <laughs> on on, on media. social media, social we don't just media. follow women. Social media. <laughs> so like, um, you, you know women on LinkedIn, Twitter, etc. Oh, and you figure out, figure out who you appreciate, right? You say like, okay, I like your work, etc. When you have a job posting, reach out to them directly via DM. Don't just post it and expect them to apply. Reach out via DM and say, hey, Zoe, you should apply for this job because you are super good at teaching people to use Teams and them ignoring you, so you can work here and they won't ignore you, I'll make sure. <laughs> you would be like, I'm interested in that conversation. right? Reach out to them specifically with why. And immediately they're gonna go, oh, I don't think I'm qualified for that blah blah because they're going to be suspicious. Why are you reaching out to me? Be like, no, really, I think you're qualified because of this. And then it'll get in their head that you think I'm qualified, overcome imposter syndrome, et cetera, et cetera. But then they'll apply for your job. I just did this. Yeah. So Frank Shaw, who's the um, CVP of, of corporate communications at Microsoft, hiring a technical assistant, he reached out to me and says, do you want this? I'm like, yes, but I'm really happy with my job. He's like, OK, I reached out to you. What do we do? I'm like. Now, let's go reach out to a bunch of other people. But he reached out directly. He didn't post it and expect me to see. He reached out directly and said, I respect you. You're one of the most technical people I know. You know about every product of Microsoft. You'd be awesome at this. The whole job is like, you know, figure out Microsoft tech and figuring out what the stories look like, but cool, creating cool tech demos. And I'm like, that's a sweet job. Um, but I'm very happy with that. So I said, all right, let's reach out to these three people who I know, who I think are awesome, who'd be great. And so he and I reached out and they're like, wow, I'm not qualified at all, but it's wild that you two are reaching out. I'm like, you're first of all super qualified. We don't reach out to people who think are morons. We generally don't want to look stupid. So this is why we're reaching out to you. And now three out of three have, have applied for his role. So hardcore volunteering. Nice. But it works. Yeah, cool. It works. It takes work, but it works. Um, so, I, so I typically hire for skills, um, although I think attitude is um, actually more important because you can teach a lot of the skills. Um, 
And, um, you know, if you've got a role, I, I, w I wouldn't necessarily go for someone who was less qualified just because they were female, because you do want the right person for the role. But if you've got two candidates who are, um, you know, they've kind of got an equal set of skills and experience, I absolutely think that we should be positively indexing for women and for some of the other uh, kind of uh, gender verticals, as, uh, sorry, diversity verticals as well, because until we've actually got a proper balance and proper diversity, um, you know, we, we need to be proactive about it. Um, okay, to challenge you on that, the, the woman's carried two people, two, the weight of two people to get to that same place. Mm. So even if they're not as qualified, slightly less qualified, does the journey not count towards... Is it qualifications or is it experience? I don't, know, I don't know the answer to that, so I'm not yeah. going to give you a false I I find people with less experience far more harm. I do that all the time. Like recently, I operations for LinkedIn. And there's a guy, he, uh, he's a militia, and he's like, I want this job so bad, I don't know more than anything I've ever learned in my life. And everything I don't know about Azure, I will learn at play. And I'm like, you're clear information. I'm like, okay, Sean, I like you, that's very exciting. So I scheduled him to loop. Then I interviewed somebody who's you know, done operations stuff for a long time, they're like, yeah, I can do this, this is on my list, that's it. Definitely more qualified. But this guy shows up. going to be really excited when the days get bad and hell, but that's who I hire. So I look at it like that because who wants to join, honestly? Because we're trying to hire, like they maintain energy when the days suck, which they do a lot sometimes. Um, but I think it, it's so situational. You know, I don't disagree with Kim's view because, you know, she may not have gotten those experiences because, you know, she's got family, society, things. And you're trying to round out your diverse portfolio, right? A team is a portfolio. You want to have diversity in your portfolio. That way you bring different points of view, different experiences, different skills. So I look at hiring like that. I would not hire someone like me because there'd be two annoying people in there, right? <laughs> there'd be one annoying people. But he was not. How are we doing on time? Uh, it needs to wrap up soon. <laughs> um, <laughs> Go I, We're almost 15 minutes over. Okay. <laughs> 20. Two seconds. I, I struggle with the concept of positive diversity. Because, uh, uh, discrimination, thank you. Um, just because I think you shouldn't do a job you're not qualified to do. If they're qualified to do the job and everything else is equal, then I would go with the personality that fits in better with the team. If that's equal, then yeah, go for a balance, go for a mix. But otherwise, I don't like the idea personally. We need more people, but we need to... The reason we struggle with diversity in teams is because we don't have the diversity of people coming forward to be in the teams. We need to make it possible for them to come in, not necessarily advantage them over others. It's a very difficult question, but either you have to be able to do the job, otherwise you shouldn't be in the job. I will tell you the worst thing to answer to me right now. He said, so I was chosen to run the Windows Insider program, right? So the guy who founded it is Gabe. He's, you know, 40 something, white dude, VP, really smart guy, very smart. He was my mentor. And when it was time to choose a successor, he looked at like a 25 people and said, you should do it. I'm like, uh, no. And then he had to talk me into it, just fair. And the first week, someone on the team said, well, Gabe needed a diverse hire, so he chose you. And we all know that. And I'm like, yeah, I don't like that. I'm like, yeah, I don't like that. So I went to Gabe, I'm like, F you, I'm so mad at you. How can you do this? Choose me as a diverse hire? You should have chosen that dude. Gabe is like, you think I would let that guy tweet to 17 million people? He can't have a conversation with one person without them wanting to slap him. I'm like, <laughs> he's like, who, Donna, would you choose at Microsoft to talk weekly to 17 million people about Windows builds, other than the person who built five versions of this operating system? Please go on. I'm like, 
Yes. <laughs> Woo. So, um, obviously, we're very much running over time now. Um, <laughs> basically, thank you everyone for attending this session. Hopefully, you know, you've talked something about it. Um, since you're all travelling back home, our podcast is on Spotify, YouTube. <laughs> <laughs> but now, seriously, um, please, please follow Andrew. us. Yeah. <laughs> please, please follow us. Um, you know, we, we, me and John are trying to do big things, to basically trying to help women in tech. Um, and one of my next big things I'm trying to do is hold, do a, a whole like, women in tech conference, um, which will probably be next year now. Try and basically get more women to, involved in, you know, IT and help with present, presentation skills. So, thank you very much, and uh, enjoy the rest of the day. See you later. No, 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 no. We're doing it ourselves.